Okay, in the last lecture, we talked about the 60 SRAM bit cell. Now let's go deeper into the operation of the bit cell itself. Okay, and we'll start with the the general easy case of hold, which is basically what we discussed before. So we have here M3 and M1 make this uh, left-facing inverter, and we have M6 and M4 making this right-facing inverter, and we have the access transistors M2 and M5. During hold, we're going to shut off the, bit, the word lines, so these two guys are going to be held at ground, and now we will um, assume for this... Uh, assumption that on the left side here we have a 1 so um, Q is holding a 1 and the right side will have a 0 so let's see how that works out we have VDD actually stored at Q and again everything here is symmetric so we can just flip everything around and put the 1 on QB and the 0 on Q we would be holding a, a 0 state so if we have Q equaling VDD we see that Q propagates over to here and to here and we get VDD over here and VDD over here the top one shuts off M6, and the bottom one enables M4, driving QB down to ground, so QB is at zero. This zero propagates through over here to that and to that, and the zero at M1 shuts off M1, the zero at M3 enables M3, driving the node over here, Q, up to VDD, and keeping it stable at VDD, and that's our bi-stability property. Of course, M2 and M5 are shut off due to uh, the word lines being a ground. Bit line and bit line bar, um, we don't actually care that much what state they're in, because uh, they're floating, they're cut off from, uh, or at least floating in this schematic, they're cut off from the internals of the SRM cell, but usually in general, since we're going to pre-charge during read to VDD, um, these are often going to be assumed to be at VDD. They may even be kept at VDD. So that's the hold operation. Going over to the read operation, what we can see here is I just chose that same situation where we are holding VDD uh, and ground. So this is the situation we're storing a one in the in the cell. Okay, and uh, I show the same uh, propagation of the voltages inside that we saw before. But now for read, what we're going to do again is we're going to pre-charge the uh, bit line and the bit line bar up to VDD. So we can assume that they're at least at the beginning of the operation statically held at VDD. And we're going to turn on the word lines. Okay, again, taking our... Um, our, our sch schematic and the state it's in right now, we should really erase all of the shut off transistors. So M6 is off and M1 is off. And now we can redraw this whole thing to look like a uh, equivalent schematic. And what we get is this. So we take the left side over here and draw it um, on this side over here. And if we look at M3, we see that M3, its gate is connected to QB over here. And QB is equal to zero. So we can see here that we grounded M3, at least at the beginning of the operation. Okay. Um, then M3 is also connected uh, to VDD on one side and Q on the other side, as we can see here, and we know that Q is equal to VDD. Then we can look at M2, and M2 we see that its gate is connected to the word line, which we turned on, so the word line is driven up to VDD. And then one side of it is connected to Q as uh, uh, over here, um, and that makes our um, situation like this. And the other side is connected to the bit line, and the bit line is held at VDD, as we said before. If we look at the other side, we can take M4. M4 now is connected to VDD because that's uh, the Q node over here, okay, which is at VDD in this situation. And M5 over here is connected to the word line, which is also set at VDD, as you can see here. M5 on one hand, the other one side is connected to QB, and M4 is connected to QB, and that causes this connection between them. The other side of M5 is connected to bit line bar, which again we assume at the beginning is at VDD, and M4 is grounded on its source. Okay, so we get these two schemes. So let's look at the left side over here. On the left side, we have this transistor is on, and this transistor is on, but what we have here is that Q is set to VDD, both bit line and 
uh, both the sources of the NMOS and the PMOS are both at VDD. That means everybody's happy and we stay at VDD. In fact, on the left side, nothing changes. Um, again, looking at our schematic, we pre-charge this to VDD. We enabled M2 and nothing changed over here. So we don't have to actually look deeper into <coughs> the left side. But on the right side, that's not um, the case because we have a zero stored inside the cell. We have VDD outside the cell and we enable uh, this uh, word line over here. So what happens is, is we're having a contention between M4 and M5. M4 is trying to drive Q bar down to zero and M5 is trying to lift Q bar up to VDD. So this is our schematic and what we get, um, we can call it an NMOS inverter. So before we had CMOS and we could mix between NMOSs and PMOSs, this was one of the styles of making uh, inverters. We'd take a like diode connected turned on uh, pull up and we'd have a uh, pull down that was um, controlled by whatever the, the, the pull down logic was. And if we um, look at this type of a thing, what happens here is that M4 is pulling Q bar down very strongly because it's an NMOS and it's good at pulling. Um, but M5 is also is pulling it up and it's not as strong, depending again on the ratio of sizes between M4 and M5. But of course, an NMOS pulls um, weaker than a, uh, a to one than it does to zero. So we will usually get something that's lower than VDD over two, uh, but it's higher than zero. Um, that will be the uh, V out low of this type of an inverter, and we'll call um, the, uh, the the uh, output delta V. So the QB voltage is going to rise, and it's going to be at some sort of delta V. Now, is that okay? Um, maybe. Um, it's okay as long as this delta V doesn't cross the threshold of this inverter over here and flip the whole cell and then uh, be pulled up to VDD. So we do not want to flip the cell and read. We just want to read um, the state until we get enough of VDD over here, the pre-charged VDD that's going to drop down to some sort of VDD minus delta that we can sense. Let's look at that a bit closer. So again, this is the picture we had on the other side. And now um, we have our NMOS inverter over here. And if we try to write out this, uh, the uh, equations that make this, okay, we can write what the um, actual equations that make it up are and, uh, uh, and, and then find out what we think is the ratio between them. And we can write in the end that delta V, this, uh, uh, the, this uh, voltage that we have left over can be um, d described with uh, a bunch of constants that we know, like VD sat, the, the VT of the N, and so forth. Uh, but we write down something that we call CR, where CR is defined, or cell ratio is defined as the size of W4 uh, of M4, so W4 over L4, uh, 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 divided by the size of M5, W5. Um, uh, on L5. So the cell ratio is the um, how much M4 is stronger than M5. Okay, so what does it tell us? Well, if we plot this kind of um, equation that we found down here, what we can see here is that, that the delta V, this is the voltage rise that we get this delta V on the output of our inverter here is, is dependent on cell ratio. And the lower the cell ratio is, the higher delta V is. And again, we if delta V goes too high, it's going to flip the whole thing and we're going to accidentally write into the cell. We're not, we don't want to allow that. Um, that means in, in the case that it's low, it means that the uh, the the access transistor, the uh, M5, is much stronger than the pull-down transistor. On the other hand, if the pull-down transistor is much stronger than uh, than the access transistor, if M4 is much stronger than M5, we're going to go to the right of this graph, and the cell that means the cell ratio is larger. We're going to get a smaller voltage rise, and that's what we'd like. The voltage rise is some sort of a um, noise that happens on, inside the cell. It, it it depletes our noise margin at that point, and we don't like that. So we're going to want a, a high cell ratio. But in, as a general rule of thumb, um, we can take a cell ratio of about one between one and one and a half. Something like 1.2 should be an okay cell ratio um, to keep the pull down transistor stronger than the access transistor. So that's our read constraint for an SRAM cell. How about our write constraint? Okay, so again, this is the same uh, type of a situation. This time we decided to have a zero stored in our uh, 
in our cell, but again, everything here is symmetric, so it doesn't really matter. And what we want to do is we want to write a one to the cell. We do not know what the contents of the cell are, but, um, but we don't care if we have already a one in here to write a one again. So we're going to assume now that we have the opposite situation. We want to write a one into the cell, but right now it's storing a zero. So the way we do that is we drive the bit line um, to VDD and we drive the bit line bar to zero. And at the end, what we're, have, what we're supposed to see is we're supposed to have a one and a VDD and zero at the Q and QB nodes, which is opposite of the current situation. Well, again, let's go and make our equivalent scheme of this thing. Okay, and what we see here is VDD cuts off M3 in this case and zero cuts off M4 in this case. And then we'll see what we get. So um, on one side, we actually get the same type of a situation that we had um, on the previous slide. So as you can see here, um, again, bit line is, is at VDD, which is connected to M2, and the word line, of course, is on. So we get the same um, pull up NMOS over here. And on the other hand, at M1, we again have this NMOS that's pulling down, and it's pulling down node Q. Um, so we know we're going to get this delta V that we found on the previous slide according to the cell ratio. That's going to be the steady state uh, of this guy. So it's going to go up a bit by delta V. But do you remember that we um, actually planned this cell that uh, it wouldn't, that delta V wouldn't be high enough to actually flip the flip the cell. So then if we look at the other side, on the other hand, we get a different situation than we had um, during read. Okay, in this case, again, we have QB here, which is connected to M6 and M5. If we look at M6, M6 has zero at the, uh, at the input because right now Q is still at zero, at least at the beginning of the operation. And uh, we have VDD at the source. M5 has a, a strong one at its input because that's the word line. And at the output, we have, uh, at, the, at the source, we have a zero because bit line bar is held strong to zero. So on the left side, again, we have the same situation as during read where the delta V ha it has to be smaller than the th switching threshold of, uh, of the cross-coupled inverters. But on the right side, we get something interesting. And this something is what we call a pseudo NMOS inverter. So again, this is another logic style that um, has uh, been used in the past, which is pseudo NMOS, where we have a kind of a bleed transistor pulling up the, uh, the, the pull-up network, and we just implement the pull-down network with whatever our logic is. And this is the situation here. Um, and again, what we have in a pseudo NMOS inverter is that we always have something that's larger than zero when we uh, put VDD at the input. Okay, we, we have a V out low that is higher than zero. So this is the, the V out low, the minimum V out low of this pseudo NMOS type of inverter. Um, and, and, and again, what we're trying to do here is take this VDD and drop it down to zero, drop it down to something that is lower than the threshold voltage of this left pointing inverter, and then we flip the cell. And that's good because the V out low minimum, if we design this pseudo NMOS uh, inverter correctly, then it will be lower than something like VDD over two, which is the trip point of the inverters. So again, um, if we take that drawing and, and make our uh, pseudo NMOS inverter over here on the right side, what we can do is, again, we can write the equations of what happens to the PMOS over here um, and, and uh, the NMOS over here. We can, uh, so we can assume that the PMOS is in velocity saturation and the NMOS is maybe in linear if, uh, if this uh, QB is very low and uh, if the VOL min is very low. And if we solve it, again, we can write all kinds of constants like VDD and VT and so forth, but keep a um, some sort of a parameter that we call PR. That's the pull-up ratio. The pull-up ratio is now how much stronger or weaker M6 is in, rela in relation to M5. Okay, so um, if we plot again the, uh, the, 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 the QB, the minimum QB, uh, value in, uh, in, uh, as a function of pull-up ratio. So what we have here is that as long as we make the pull-up ratio uh, lower, which means making the uh, PMOS, making the pull-up PMOS uh, uh, weaker than the, pull, the, than the access NMOS, then we're going to have our cell voltage drop. And where we want to be is over here. Okay, we want QB, the VOL min to drop below the threshold that will flip the whole uh, cross couple inverter structure. And um, a good point is being under something like 1.8, we, 
will probably provide us a low enough cell ratio that we can uh, be sure that we're going to flip the, the cell. So this is the pull-up ratio of the cell, and that's our right constraint. Okay, so um, if we summarize that, we have our read constraint and our write constraint. There are two constraints, again, in sizing in SRAM. And we said that the cell ratio, okay, is basically the ratio between the pull-down transistor, our NMOS, and our access transistor, okay? And what do we see? We see we want the, the, um, the cell ratio to be as large as possible. So we want our pull-down transistor to be as large as possible in relation to our access transistor, or as strong as possible. Then we have our right constraint over here, which we saw we have the pull-up ratio. And with the pull-up ratio, we want it to be as small as possible. The pull-up ratio is the pull-up um, transistor, so that's the PMOS, uh, how, how much stronger it is than the access transistor. And again, we want the PMOS to be as weak as possible as compared to the access transistor. So again, looking at that, for the read constraint, we want the drive strength of the pull-down to be larger than the drive strength of the access. And for the pull-up, uh, for the right constraint, we want the access transistor drive strength to be larger than the pull-up transistor. And luckily, that fits together well, and that allows the SRAM to work. So we want our pull-down to be much stronger than our access transistor, and we want our access transistor to be much stronger than our pull-up transistor, and that ratio does not contradict. Um, this, of course, has to be traded off with the size constraints of our cell. The, the larger we make our, um, the, our transistors, and if we don't use minimum size transistors, we are going to have a larger cell. So usually a kind of a, a, of a type of ratio looks at this is, remember, this is an NMOS, this is an NMOS, and this is a PMOS. And um, the NMOS here is pulling to ground, okay, and we need it to be stronger than the access transistor. So we'll usually have something like 1.5 or 1.2 times the minimum width, times W min. The, since an NMOS is uh, inherently larger than a PMOS transistor, or stronger than a PMOS transistor, at least in older technologies, what we'll do is we'll just use a, a minimum sized NMOS here and a minimum sized PMOS here. That makes the PMOS the weakest, uh, the weakest there is without actually uh, increasing the length. So pretty much that's the kind of um, uh, a rule of thumb to design your SRAM cell. Make the pull-down transistor a bit wider than the uh, access transistor, which will be minimum sized, and the pull-up transistor, which will also be minimum sized. I will note that uh, the actual um, the actual transistors that are used in um, commercial technologies are not standard transistors that meet the design rules that you have to meet when you do layout in the lab. They use something called pushed rules, which... Uh, are special transistors that um, that have been tested and checked, and they don't meet standard layout. They're a bit different. Maybe the even the doping is a bit different on them. Um, they obviously meet these two constraints, uh, but they're not transistors that you can go and use in other types of circuits. Just another point uh, before finishing this uh, this chapter of of the lesson. There is something called a 4T memory cell. There's actually many different types of memory cells, but I just wanted to show you a few. This is a historical cell. And um, what we saw before is, again, we want the pull-down transistors, the M2 over here, to be much stronger than the access transistors, which is noted as M4 over here. And we want the pull-up transistor be, uh, to be weaker than that. Well, we can make it really weak. In fact, the pull-up transistor has basically no um, no uh, um, job except for to make sure that there's something that can give us replenish our um, our VDD level if it somehow is depleted or to help us pull up the the um, internal nodes when we want to write a one to one of the sides. So we can actually replace it not with a transistor but with a really large resistor. So if we can put a real large resistor here, the resistor can be made in a in a um, uh, in a uh, layer that is not a, a that's not a planar layer that's not a transistor layer it can be put on top of the cell and we can use four transistors with a with a pair of resistors that sit on top of them and achieve a cell this used to be a popular cell in very very old technologies where the size of transistors was ultra expensive and uh, resistors may not have been as expensive but the thing is that this is always going to be leaking so when we have a basically a one uh, uh, when, when our NMOS is open and we're driving a zero to one of the sides, then 
there's going to be leakage or static current that's going to be um, running through the, the one of these uh, resistors, and that's going to um, really cause a, a lot of static power, and so they don't use this type of thing anymore. But there are similar types of structures like this that have been tried, and you may run into them. Um, another um, alternative type of cell that I do want to mention, and these are used, are multiported SRAMs. The SRAM that we looked at up till now, it had just one port. The word line, basically, um, there was one word line, which means that whenever we open the cell, it's either going to do a read or a write, but only that operation during that clock cycle. Um, sometimes you want to read from multiple um, addresses at the same time or write to multiple addresses at the same time. And for that, you need uh, multi-ported memory. You can use flip-flops to do it, or um, you can use a multi-ported uh, memory like a multi-ported SRAM. So there are different ways to do this, but the easiest way, I guess, uh, would be just to add another pair of access transistors for each port. So here you see we've added uh, another access transistor pair over here, and we added another bit line, and we added another word line. Um, I guess uh, I marked word line one as the, the, the new one, but you see that these are completely independent of each other. Um, as long as we don't select the same um, address, but with both uh, ports uh, and one trying to do a read and one trying to do a write, then we should be okay and we're able to operate this cell. So that's called a dual ported SRAM. We can independently do one read or one write on each of these ports. So it's called a 2RW type of a cell. Two reads and writes, either read or write simultaneously. On the other hand, we also have a two-ported SRAM, which is a very popular structure, and it's used for other types of things as well, where um, we add another um, read word line, which goes over here. You see this read word line, and it's connected to a pair of transistors over here. And the transistor, the bottom one, it is actually um, sampling. It's connected to one of the internal nodes, usually Q bar, but it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, without interfering with it, it's not actually connected to it, uh, s similar to one of these guys. So it doesn't um, impede the, uh, the readability. It doesn't cause any noise, basically, on this internal node. But um, it does have, uh, it senses the situation of this node, just similar to what our pull down over here is. And then when we um, when we enable the read word line, then if there is a uh, one both here and this is enabled, then we will pull down the read bit line. If there is a zero over here, then this will be off and we won't pull it down. So we will see that the read word line, if this is RWL, it will either stay constant or it will drop and we have to sense that with our sense amplifier. So in this way, we were able to have one port that we could read and write on, as we saw before, and another port that it can independently read from the cell as long as we're um, choosing a different address. And choosing a different address will usually be done at the architectural level. So this is actually um, uh, a one read, one write type of a, um, or it can all actually be uh, one read write and uh, uh, one read write and one, uh, read type of a thing, but this is a two-ported um, SRAM cell.